Hello, greetings. Thank you for attending NRRA's Solid Waste Facility Operator Training Module, Things That Go Boom and Other Regulated Wastes. We are pleased that you joined us today because even if a facility does not accept regulated waste for disposal, having a working knowledge of the types of regulated waste, what hazards they present, and the disposal options available for each of them will help operators and others do their jobs more effectively. Today's presenters, back once again with you, Cindy Sterling, Grants Manager and Educator, and Sarah McGraw, School Program Special Projects Manager. And we are so happy to be doing our third live webinar. So again, welcome to our Community Educators and Environmental Ambassadors. The Northeast Resource Recovery Association is pleased to present today's training, which is made possible in part by a generous grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development. And the goals here, the objectives of our grant is to cross train the solid waste facility operators and school staff, take down the wall between towns and schools and increase our education program audience through online learning. So this training is free. And after you view the webinar, please complete the webinar evaluation to help us understand your knowledge and the steps you want to take to assist your community with managing materials comprehensively. Once you submit the evaluation, you can download a certificate of completion for this webinar. So to do that, you will receive the evaluation link for this webinar via email. And then once you complete that, you can have your certificate. If you have any technical difficulties during this program, please send an email to info at nrra.net. And just briefly about us, you probably already know who we are, but just in case you don't, we uh, started in 1981 with just four New Hampshire municipalities that they founded the Northeast uh, Resource Recovery Association. But at that time, they were called the New Hampshire Resource Recovery Association. The goal was to provide a clearinghouse for current up-to-date information and a source of technical and marketing assistance in the general areas of waste reduction and recycling. In 1995, we amended to the Northeast Resource Recovery Association because we started going beyond the New Hampshire borders. It was became more than just four New Hampshire municipalities, and now we cover the entire Northeast. We are basically a one-stop shop for all things recycling. We monitor both the international markets paying attention to what's happening in the European community, for example. And then recently, as a result of the Chinese national sword policy, we're paying lots more attention to what's going on in the European community and elsewhere, and also the impact that it has here domestically in the United States. NRRA also has a lovely school recycling club that gives new or existing school groups a chance to join a program that will help them promote or advance the waste reduction and recycling efforts through networking and hands-on education. The club offers classroom workshops and uh, technical assistance programs. So we have four classroom workshops and you can see them listed here. And then we have the three technical assistance programs for the schools. The workshops are in class. They're great for K through 12 grades. We tailor them to fit the curricular and the development needs of any class. And then the technical assistance programs are designed to work at a larger school-wide level and focus on the big picture problems and solutions. And if you have you know, more questions about that, please just email the club at nrra.net. For our operators, we do these trainings that are called MOM trainings, Members Operations Marketing Monthly Meetings. In addition to the NRA monthly meetings, we conduct workshops and facility tours several times a year that can be used for continuing edu education credits toward transfer facility operator certifications and renewals. These mom meetings are just a great way for the operators to get together with vendors, to get together with the state representatives and just have a chit chat morning. And then we also have our conference that happens in May and that is for the solid waste specialists, I will call them, um, anyone who works in that field, as well as we invite schools and educators to come. So it's a two-day event, and that happens in May. So we still have some time before the next one. As part of our 
um, mom meetings, because they happen here in Epsom, New Hampshire, not everybody can join those meetings. So we've started taking the topics, the key topics from those meetings and making these training modules out of them for operators and then bringing these trainings to your community. So today we're doing the things that go boom. These all are part of NRRA's best management practice guide. And all of them provide strategies for solid waste facility operators to do their jobs more effectively, protect the public health and environment, and as I said before, earn professional development credits where it's applicable. And thanks to the USDA funding that we have received for this year, all of these modules now are going to be available on our website, nrra.net, as a webinar. The purpose of the operator trainings that we do are to ensure that operators are aware of potential adverse environmental impacts at facilities, increase compliance with rules, reduce accidents or other threats to health safety of operators, volunteers, the public, and others that use a solid waste facility. Uh, what I have here, just want to give a shout out to NHDES because NRRA assists the state of New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services with providing the solid waste facility operator trainings. And it's an opportunity for the continuing professional development and for first time solid waste facility operators to start getting credits towards their, um, their training. They get, they get steps, they have different levels. Um, they may not get a pay raise, but at least the NHDES recognizes how the operators need to be trained to work at a facility. And if you wanna know more about that, you can contact NHDES, the Solid Waste Division. Also giving a shout out to the state of Vermont um, because even though they don't officially provide um, the professional training to solid waste operators, NRRA does. And the trainings have become more pertinent since Act 48, 148, and the new Vermont Materials Management Plan that created new policy, planning, and outreach requirements for all Vermont's waste districts, alliances, independent towns, and all other solid waste management entities. So in regards to things that go boom, today's module, the fact that Vermont solid waste entities have to provide a four, that's four household hazardous waste collections every year. And this could be quite daunting, especially expense wise, since a HHW collection can cost 6,000, 20,000, 42,000, but maybe even $77,000. It all depends on the participation rate, the types of hazardous waste collected, the collection and disposal methods, and so all of which we will be covering in today's module. And lastly, just did you know that if you are working at a recycling facility, a transfer station facility, you have one of the top 10 most dangerous jobs, as noted by the US Department of Labor back in 20. 13, these numbers are from that. So there were 33 deaths per 100,000, and most of them are due to accidents and exposure to hazardous materials and heavy equipment. And then I'm just gonna share with you this graph from that report from the 2013 US Department of Labor report. And loggers are at the top with the most dangerous job. And towards the center at that 33%, are the refuse and recyclable material collectors. We are not as dangerous as roofers, aircraft pilots, and fisher workers, fishers. And we are just a little bit more dangerous than mining machine operators. So again, as I mentioned in the beginning, this training module was created to help you have a working knowledge of the types of regulated waste what hazards they present, and the disposal options available for each of them. NRRA Things That Go Boom includes general information regarding several common regulated wastes and the best practices to manage these wastes. It also describes a variety of hazardous materials collection programs and generalized state and federal regulations. And um, even if you are that facility that does not accept regulated waste for disposal, you will find that the material covered here will help you do your job more effectively because we know residents will approach an operator to ask about disposal options and as well materials get surreptitiously dropped at the transfer station 
and then the operator has to handle that material and the municipality has to pay for proper disposal. So the regulated um, topics, waste topics at the transfer station for handling hazardous waste are going to be, we're going to cover today the large and small quantity generators, what is household hazardous waste, the collection procedures, what are some of the common regulated waste, the universal waste, electronics, sharps, and other odds and ends. And feel free to begin a group discussion on hazardous waste found at facilities by chatting with us. And you can do that by clicking on the chat icon, the little speech balloon in the dialog box at the lower left corner of your screen. And as well, if you have any questions, um, type them there. And we'll get to them throughout the webinar. Uh, we may pause and read a few, or if they just come up with the topic at hand, we'll take time to answer the questions. First and foremost, very important to identify the waste. Currently, more than 500 wastes are listed as hazardous in the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 40, and you're gonna, we'll be referring to that quite a bit. Wastes are listed as hazardous because they are known to be harmful to human health and the environment when not managed properly. Even if a waste does not appear on one of the hazardous waste lists, it still might be considered hazardous if it demonstrates one or more of the following characteristics. And these characteristics are ignitability, corrosive, reactive, and toxic. If the waste contains any of the toxic constituents above the regulatory level, it is required to carry the specific hazardous waste D code. So that's associated with the constituents. So what you'll see in the following slides as we break down these uh, four areas, they'll all have a D code to them. And that's EPA's way of marking them. So ignitability, um, it has the D001. It's a solid waste that exhibits the characteristics of being ignitable. Um, if a representative sample of the waste has any of the following properties, the flash point is less than 140, it is an oxidizer, it is flammable, compressed gas, it is liquid capable of fire through friction, absorption of moisture or spontaneous chemical change. It is, um, examples would be acetone, which are, I think that's nail polish remover, mm -hmm. and then toluene, ethanol as well, we know what ethanol is, but toluene is a chemical we've been finding yep. in the closets of custodians at schools that um, are in a lot of the cleaning products. Yep. when you're eating a lot of the products that we're finding. And it's also a carcinogen. And for you, maybe at the transfer station, you may see those uh, nail polish removers coming in. Also, there's paints and certain degreasers and solvents. Corrosivity, corrosivity is D002. It's a solid waste that exhibits the characteristic of being corrosive. Uh, when, again, a representative sample of the waste has either of the following properties. Will etch metals and burn flesh, liquid with a pH of less than or equal to two or greater than equal to 1.2.5 or the waste that corrodes steel at a rate of greater than a quarter inch per year. Examples are caustic brake cleaner, pool acids, um, yeah, there's a bunch of others too. Uh, rust removers, acid or alkaline cleaning fluids, battery acid. And what's important here is the pH scale that will measure how acidic or basic a substance is. So that pH scale ranges from zero to 14, seven is neutral, a pH less than seven is considered acidic, and a pH greater than seven is basic. And basically what this is measuring is how quickly and severely a aqueous a liquid material will destroy human skin. So if a product corrodes metal or has a very high or low pH, it is known as a corrosive waste. 
And here we have just a few examples of your common products. The pH of Drano is 11.5, so that's very basic. It's, um, and then pH of the CLR is 0 0.8, and that means it's acidic. And so remember those guidelines were less than or equal to 2 or greater than or equal to 12.5 as determined by the pH test. Um, reactive, reactivity is D003. It's a solid waste that exhibits the characteristic of reactivity if a representative sample of the waste has any of the following properties. Undergoes rapid, violent reaction when exposed to water, shock, heat, or pressure. Things that react badly with water or air might be packaged in oil or water. It is a cyanide or sulfide bearing product. Things that explode, TNT, ethyl ethyl, dry picric acid. It is unstable and produces, so simply it is unstable and explodes and produces toxic fumes, gases, and vapors when mixed with the water or under other conditions such as heat or pressure. Um, that's about it for that. Oh, and we have a little boom. And then the toxicity. So toxic waste are considered hazardous due to the presence of toxic constituents in the waste above established regulatory levels. It is harmful or fatal when ingested or absorbed, or it leaches toxic chemicals into the soil or groundwater when disposed of on land. And so everything that is known is a toxic waste that will do that. And following the slide, we have the tables that cover the codes between D004 to D043, because the waste codes for toxic waste, there's quite a few of them out there. They contain too much of a certain dangerous chemical, includes metals, pesticides, and other contaminants. It is, um, yeah, it's harmful or fatal when ingested. And so here we have just a few examples. So these are some of the common household products collected at an HHW event that are toxic. Um, it should also be noted that the household products can be a blend of characteristics. You know, so for example, you may have one of these that are toxic, but also flammable, or toxic and corrosive. And the following tables, as I mentioned earlier, are a list of the regulatory, the current regulatory levels for toxic constituents used in manufacturing. So we have um, the solid wastes that exhibit the characteristics of toxicity has these EPA hazardous waste numbers that are specified in the left column, and it corresponds to the toxic contamination causing it to be hazardous. So you can see we go from arsenic to 2,4-dinitrotoluene. Um, and these you know, will be on the label of products that people bring to your HHW day. Um, the regulatory level is over to the right, so again, they have to stay within that level. A solid waste exhibits the characteristic of toxicity if the extract from a representative sample of the waste contains any of these contaminants as well at the concentration equal to or greater than the respective value given in that table. So again, that's the column to the right. So we'll just keep going on from D to pyridine lindane, mercury, lead, methyl ethyl ketone. And these are the what's presently, they do change um, or chemicals get added. And you can see that then these are the final ones. And if you wanted to know more about these, then you could always visit the uh, Code of Federal Regulations um, which is Title 40 and then Chapter, Subchapter, Part 261. So just go to the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations and look for Title 40, Protection of the Environment. Part 261 is the identification and listing of hazardous waste. So how do you know, how do you know it's hazardous waste? 
we kept talking about this test that you know how did you know if it was uh, beyond that specified amount um, exhibits the characteristic of toxicity so to determine if a waste displays the toxicity characteristic we do or someone does a toxicity characteristic leaching procedure or also known as tclp in the field um, to it's performed to see if that that chemical is toxic and so the tclp the way that this test goes it's basically a soil sample extraction method for chemical analysis employed as an analytical method to stimulate leaching through a landfill it mimics leaching through a landfill through soil and so the testing methodology is used to determine if a waste is characteristically hazardous that means it would go on the d list and then as you know for companies this is really what companies need to know about the businesses that, that are creating the products um, like Procter and Gamble or I don't know whatever other cleaning products are out there where you're creating the paint Benjamin Moore um, and so a company can determine if their waste exhibits a characteristic of a hazardous waste by using the knowledge of the hazardous characteristics in light of the process activity during the manufacturing and the raw materials that are used in the process. TCLPs, rarely have I ever gotten a question about that, but every now and then a person will actually ask me, well, how do you know it is toxic? So you at the transfer station can now say that it is that leaching, it mimics the leaching test. It mimics the landfill conditions. And if the contaminant exceeds the specified amount, then it's toxic. And this is all regulated by the RICRA, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which was passed by Congress in 1976 to provide a cradle to grave management of hazardous waste. It's enforced by the following governmental agencies, EPA, and then your state. So it's not the town, it's not you. You can always refer somebody to the Federal Environmental Protection Agency guidelines, websites, or have them contact your State Department of Environment, Conservation, Protection, um, Environmental Services. We got a little glitch here I see on the, the graphic. The training requirements, um, EPA and your state agency require documented training for individuals who handle or generate hazardous waste. And we just got um, a comment, which is a great, great comment from an um, employee at NHDES that these um, types of waste we are talking about are not solid waste, and are reg but are regulated as hazardous waste. Yes. So thank you for making that comment. Yeah, and this is all about hazardous waste today. And then when we get to the common regulated wastes, Okay, so how do we identify whether someone is a hazardous waste generator? Any person, municipality, or business who produces hazardous waste or creates a mixture with hazardous waste. Anyone who accepts hazardous waste from a conditionally exempt generator. And a transporter who mixes waste of different shipping descriptions. So if you're a municipality and you are collecting uh, conditionally exempt generator waste from a small business, then you are then known as the generator because then you would have to be transporting it to another facility. Um, you could also have that hazmat company come in and pass off the generator status to them if they're transporting it. So this is business hazardous waste. Um, just to, you know, you can do a whole module on business hazardous waste, but we just want to give you a little bit of a introduction to the different generator status because I just talked about the conditionally exempt um, small quali quality gen quantity generators. So many industries generate hazardous waste. A generator is any person, like I said, who produces a hazardous waste as listed or characterized in the Code of Federal Regulations. So we're back to that Code of Federal Re Regulations. As we already noted that the EPA regulates the hazardous waste under the RICRA 
Act to ensure these wastes are managed in ways that protect human health and the environment. And even when managed properly, some listed wastes are so dangerous that they are called acutely hazardous waste. So examples of acutely hazardous waste include uh, waste generated from some pesticides um, and that can be fatal to humans even in low doses. Generators of hazardous waste are regulated based on the amount of hazardous waste they generate in a calendar month, not the size of the business or facility. And that's important to repeat. They are regulated on the amount of hazardous waste they generate in a calendar month, not the size of the business or facility. Recognizing that generators produce waste in different quantities, EPA established these three categories of generators in the regulations. We have our large quantity generators, small quantity generators, conditionally exempt small quantity generators, and there's a new term out there now, the very small quantity generators. The LQGs are subject to many regulations in this QGs and cannot use town drop-offs or solid waste district hazardous waste programs for their hazmat waste. They must use a special hazardous waste contractor. But as I mentioned earlier, your conditionally exempt ones are very small. They have certain provisions of hazardous waste regulations that they can participate in the municipal HHW collections or contract with a private hazmat contractor. I just wanted to make a quick plug um, as we're going through things here. Um, especially if you're coming from a different state, you have different, um, you know, might have different regulations that we're talking about. I know we're both trying to talk about federal, um, but we're always want to let you know that to refer back to your state if you have questions about anything we talk about here. Okay. So the large quantity generators, and again, what you produce in a calendar month determines which regulations apply to that generator. You're going to generate 1,000 kilograms per month or more of hazardous waste or more than one kilogram per month of acutely hazardous waste. The major requirements for an LQG include you may only accumulate waste on site for 90 days, do not have a limit on the amount of hazardous waste accumulated on site. Hazardous waste generated must be managed in tanks, containers, drip pads, or containment buildings. You must comply with the hazardous waste manifest requirements and the pre-transport requirements. You must submit a biannual hazardous waste report. And most importantly, the LQGs are not bringing their waste to a transfer station for disposal the hazmat contractor collects and transports directly from the site in order for that to be handled. Now the small quantity generators and the conditionally exempt, they would generate, small quantity generators generate more than 100 kilograms, but less than 1,000 kilograms. And I converted these to pounds as well for you on the chart. The major requirements for SQGs, uh, they may accumulate hazardous waste on site for 180 days without a permit or 270 days of shipping a distance greater than 200 miles. The quantity of hazardous on site waste must never exceed 6,000 kilograms. SQGs must comply with the hazardous waste manifest requirements and the preparedness and prevention requirements that again are noticed on, noted on the uh, 40 CFR. SQGs must manage hazardous waste in tanks or containers subject to the requirements, and there must always be at least one employee available to respond to an emergency. This employee is the emergency coordinator responsible for coordinating all emergency response measures. SQGs are not required to have detailed written contingency plans. Members, what you are doing in a month, what you generated for a month. Some small quantity generators may generate this range in a month between the 100 and 1,000 kilogram. But maybe the next month, for some reason, they're not generating that much. Then for that month, they're not a small quantity generator if they decide to dispose of the waste during that month. Or maybe they decide to hold on to it and the next month equals them out to being uh, 100 to 1,000 kilograms per month. If I can just 
and interrupt for a moment just to talk about schools because we do work with schools and we're doing um, these indoor air quality assessments looking at their chemicals in schools and as we were looking up information um, and this mostly applies to New Hampshire again where it might change if you're from a different state but schools are gener small quantity generators and they must comply with the, the rules uh, as being a small quantity generator. So any school that generates hazardous waste must notify Department of Environmental Services and obtain an EPA identification number. Um, the school must keep a copy of the manifest for three years. And, and most schools are considered small quantity generators. Um, so, you know, as we're talking about use motor oil for um, um, automotive classes, waste photo processing solutions, solvents, and laboratory chemicals. So if you're a school watching right now, um, you know, I think it might be a good idea to just to take a look at what your school is doing. Um, you know, for, for the most part, schools don't generate a ton of, ton of waste, but they do have to comply with the small quantity generator um, rules. Right. And again, it all goes with what the monthly generation amount is. You may have some schools that would fall under the conditionally exempt small quantity or the very small quantity. They're the same now, as far as I understand. They generate 100 kilograms or less. So that's less than 220 pounds, which equals to about, I think it's a 55 gallon container. Someone yep. correct me if I'm wrong, but um, mm -hmm. it, it's a 55 gallon. Yep. Um, so, you know, you may fall under this conditionally exempt a very small quantity. Um, you can't, uh, you may not accumulate more than that 1,000 kilograms of hazardous waste at any time. You must identify all the hazardous waste that is generated, and you must ensure that the hazardous waste is delivered to a person or a facility who is authorized to manage it. So that means that you can come to a hazardous waste collection that your town is doing, an HHW event. So a business school that falls under this, less than 100 kilograms per month, um, could take part in the community's HHW event. Most likely there's gonna be a fee and most likely they're going to ask you to come at a different time than what all the residents are doing. So the way that usually runs is you would uh, you give a list if you're a small business or a school and you fall under the conditionally exempt small quantity or very small quantity generators, you can go ahead, send, do your inventory, send your inventory list to your municipality or solid waste district, and then they'll check it out for you. They'll send it to the hazmat contractor and get prices on it. And then they'll tell you the cost that it's going to be to bring your waste to that event. And actually the benefit to it, um, you may say, well, why don't they just come to my place and pick up my stuff? They can, they can come to your business. The hazmat folks can come to your business, but now you're paying them for that um, consolidation at your site, whereas you're just paying for the cost of the materials to be brought to HHW event where then everybody's joining in to pay the price of the consolidation. So here we go. What is a household hazardous waste? Well, it means any waste from households, including single and multiple residences, hotels and motels, bunkhouses, campgrounds, crew quarters, picnic grounds, and day use recreation areas that would be subject to regulation as hazardous waste if it were not from households. And again, you can see this is quoted by the ANR state of Vermont. So your state may have a different definition, but I thought this one was a nice complete one, especially because they include hotels and motels and bunkhouses and other things that we don't really consider um, household hazardous waste because it's not a household. The major um, categories of household hazardous materials are pretty much household cleaners, paint products, pesticides, fertilizers, automotive products, and arts and crafts related solvents and thinners. No business of any size can dispose of any amount of hazardous waste in the trash. And I just wanna throw that out here now because when we talk about households, households Household hazardous waste is not subject to hazardous waste regulations. It can be disposed of in the trash, except for your disposal banned materials. 
They cannot be thrown in the trash. We strongly discourage disposing of any HHW in landfills or incinerators because it pollutes the air and water. And as I noted earlier, the Vermont municipalities are required to provide for HHW collections. That's very serious. We do really not want to be polluting the air and the water because dumping, flushing, and pouring toxic down the drain, they can affect the ground runoff and filtration. They can affect the water treatment system. So, you know, you think you're just dumping it, it's going to get filtered by the soil. It doesn't, it goes into the groundwater. The water treatment systems, you think they're designed to handle this waste, I can do that. And that doesn't work there either. It ends up going back into the environment. This is how um, our groundwater and water cycle, just so you can see the cycle of the groundwater filtration. We have the surface water that evaporates. The water comes down as rainfall, bringing with it any airborne toxins from incineration of hazardous waste. It seeps into the grounds or streams. It gets pumped up by the well, which may or may not filter out the contamination. Septic systems, we talked about the wastewater treatment facilities. Um, they both operate, they operate on the same principle as a sector septic system except on a much larger scale. The septic system located on site treats a building's wastewater before releasing it back into the environment. However, like incinerators and landfills, septic systems are not designed to treat hazardous waste. Hazardous waste, including excessive amounts of drain openers and cleaners containing lye and strong bleach, may negatively affect the system's natural cleansing process by destroying bacteria needed to clean the water. Without these bacteria, certain pathogens will travel through the system unchanged. Since the system is not designed to treat chemical waste, household hazardous waste passes through the system unchanged and can potentially contaminate the ground and surface water. It's the same with the wastewater treatment plants, as I mentioned. They are not designed for treating hazardous waste. And here we have another one from NHDS. Thank you so much, Tara, for listening. Keep in mind, New Hampshire has slightly different classifications than EPA. We have, I believe it's full quantity generators. FQGs, full quantity generators, and small quantity generators. This falls into effect with the record keeping and the federal EPA. Okay, NHDS is more stringent for any of you New Hampshire folks watching our webinar today. Keep those comments and questions coming, everyone. As I said, we're trying to be at that national level because we really don't know who is listening. So that's why you always check with your state agency. And then I just have my little diagram here again of your household hazardous waste, where it can go if it goes to recycling, right? If it goes to a hazmat contractor who then separates it and segregates it and either sends it off to a hazardous facility, that, like an incinerator designed for hazardous waste or a landfill designed for hazardous waste, most of it they try to recycle first. So that's that left system. Incinerator, it's going into the air. Then we get to breathe it, causes health effects. If it goes into the landfill, it's just going back into that groundwater and it may come out your tap. Again, human health and the environment is why we are spending time today speaking about managing hazardous waste mindfully. Why do I care? Well, I guess this is why. Small amounts of hazardous waste in a household can be dangerous. Larger amounts that are collected at an HHW center or event can be really dangerous. So collectors must know what they are doing and collectors are held to a higher standard. And we always say that, um, you know, you're just one little household, but if you're one household and then everybody else in your neighbor is having bad habits and managing their household hazardous waste or using hazardous products and flushing them down the drain, that is a bunch of households now. So our quantities are getting much larger, heading towards the wastewater treatment plants, heading towards the groundwater and surface water, going up in the air, being incinerated and thrown away in the trash. In summary, hazardous waste from households are exempt from regulation. 
but once a municipality takes it, they become regulated. This municipality is now a generator of hazardous waste. If a municipality accepts hazardous waste from a business, it is illegal. These business-made waste can only be picked up by a registered transporter or go to an official household hazardous waste event where a registered transporter takes the waste directly. All right, so do we have any more questions or comments coming in before we move on to the next chapter? Okay, so now we're gonna to talk to you about the types of hazardous waste collections. We have the one day collection event, the mobile collection units, and then permanent collection sites. Whatever the collection method, The goals of a collection are the same. Provide proper disposal of HHW, remove HHW from homes, thus reducing exposure and potential injury, reduce the danger to waste collectors and other sanitation workers, increase general public awareness of the HHW found in most homes and how these materials may impact on the human health and the environment, and educate residents as to the best methods of HHW disposal. So I just want to take a moment and just show you this really fun video, this PSA that when I was working with the Wyndham Solid Waste Management District, we uh, created for educating our public about HHW, our HHW events. What hazardous products do you have lying around your house? Garden spray, house and rat poison. I have lighter fuel, flea killer, trichlorophenoxyacetate. It's quite toxic and I just don't want it anymore. Waiting freeze. And if swallowed, rapidly rinse mouth and immediately drink a glass full of milk or water. Do not induce vomiting. Dibuthal uh, succinate, whatever that is. Uh, how about methyl ethyl ketone? Oh, malathion. Methyl carbamate or pyrophos diethyl. Hyperonal butoxide, petroleum distillate, and again we have the happy little woman spraying it, and this kills all insects and other living things. Well, I've been waiting a long time to get rid of these things. I mean, you have stuff to get rid of, you know what to do with it? This is the place to bring it. These guys know what to do with it. What hazardous products do you have? Great. Okay, we'll just get back to this PowerPoint. And that, um, again, was our version of trying to make people aware of, um, well, Wyndham Salad Waste Management District version of trying to get people involved with their household hazardous waste collections. And that was filmed on site at one of these annual one day collections. A one day collection events are the most common approach. The planning and operation of a one day collection event involves setting the date for the collection, advertising the service to the public, and you can do it through a PSA or flyers or radio, and then conducting the program. And the number of sites and length of the program can vary. So here on this flyer, if you can read it, we have the main site, and that's that was in Brattleboro, and then we had satellite sites, the towns in Westminster, so around the district, because you know it's a region. So um, those towns that are 20 minutes away from Brattleboro, which is the main site, and so instead of asking them to come to Brattleboro, we sent out satellite um, sites. So that actually the Hazmat organization, our collector, was you know they send out a couple of their people and a truck and take care of it there and then bring it back to the main site to be packed up for the end of the day for transport. And so these days can be handled in the one of two ways, right? The individual containers can be broken down and the waste commingled within the 55 gallon drums at the collection site where all the residents drop off their HHW or you can use the uh, satellite site which um, adds to it where they're roughly segregated and then they're taken to that fixed site to be um, segregated and then finally decommissioned. 
The collection itself can be handled if you do the satellite sites, you know, by fewer people. There's only one or two. Um, and it just increases participation because you are bringing the collection to more than just one location on that one day. Um, and pretty much that one day ends up being just four hours on a Saturday. Um, and so our experience also has taught us that um, it is appropriate to try to schedule these household hazardous waste collection days in conjunction with a normal recycling facility or operation. Um, the type of people that like frequent, that likely frequent the recycling centers are the types of people who are concerned about the health and environment and therefore are more likely to properly handle the hazardous waste. Um, the one day events, you know, you can get up to your 200 plus individuals. My personal experience has proven that registering the participants lessens the waiting in line time. And I've been doing, I did these collections for like 15 years. And so we played around with that, registering, not registering. Then it was just so much nicer to register people. We pretty much put, you know, five people every five minutes. And, you know, they came around this sort of time that they were going to come around. If they were not in on their exact time, we still had it blocked out so we didn't have long lines of people. Um, it also helps to weed out those who um, don't need to attend the event. You know, they call, you ask them, what are you bringing? And they may say motor oil. And then you can say, oh, you know, you don't have to come to our event this day. You can bring motor oil every day or fluorescent light bulbs. Um, if they tell you that they're bringing a whole bunch of latex paint, you know, we want to ask how much, right? Because all of these are pretty much limited to 10 gallon. 10 gallon limitation is all you really want to take from people. Um, and, you know, you can say, oh, well, that latex paint, don't bring it to us on this very expensive day of collecting hazardous waste. You can just dry that out with kitty litter or sawdust or go purchase a hardening agent at your hardware store and then, you know, throw it in the trash or you can remove the lid if you don't want to add to it because there's not a lot in it and you can just let it dry, throw it in the trash. And so again, you're helping to reduce the cost. Um, once all of it gets collected, you've had your educated your people on the phone, great time to educate them when they're calling in to register. Uh, they call in and ask questions even if you don't have a registration. If there is that line, because there will always be a line of cars, great time to hand out any type of education material that you have about your other programs. Um, and then from here, the waste is segregate, segregated by the hazard type. It's packed in its drum, it has its appropriate lab pack, paperwork, and then they're taken, all of this waste is then taken to another facility. It's a has, household hazardous waste facility that serves as a central or regional place to then segregate and bulk it some more with other household hazardous waste that's coming in from many locations. So, and that's, you know, you get into the big, that's like in that little diagram, I had the cartoon diagram, the big facility before the recycling area those are usually owned and operated by the hazardous waste contractors, and they store these wastes until an economical volume is collected for disposal. Um, and then also they look for recycling opportunities. And in the end, you holding this event, you get the manifest from the hazardous waste contractor outlining the final destination of the waste that was collected. And these are, can be expensive, the charges for a one day event include all the labor, the supervisors, the chemists, any other additional people. You're paying for the disposal, the transportation, and then you're paying for the specific lab packs. And they have a per drum charge or a per Gaylord charge or a per five gallon bucket charge. And the way that it gets separated is by oil, flammable liquids, herbicides and pesticides, aerosols, acids and caustics, absorbent, and then miscellaneous chemicals. Again, why you really want to watch, how are those drums getting packed? Vermiculite is used to fill up the containers. You may not have a lot of hazardous waste in there, but now you're paying for like a 55 gallon drum of pretty much vermiculite. So that is all ways that you can start thinking about cost um, and saving cost. Speak to your contractor, look at how they're packing things. Tell them, they're, they're most often very good about putting things in the five uh, gallon buckets if they can. Um, so just really be aware of that. However, the, um, the charges are can be expensive, as I said, and we do have an increasing awareness that one day events are neither frequent enough nor convenient. Again, back to that. If you can have that collection happening, 
you know, if it's a nine to noon collection at your main site, do nine to 11 at a couple of the smaller sites where you can sprinkle them around the, the region. And then those trucks get back by the end of, you know, by noon or a little after, and then they stay until three o'clock, four o'clock and pack it all up before the end of the day. Um, we also know that uh, for moving companies, they're not gonna transport HHW. So people need to dispose of HHW when moving. And if there's only a one day event, they're faced with little or no option other than to put it in the trash or leave it in the house for the new occupant to be faced with the same option. So um, such practices have been known to ruin real estate transactions, surprisingly. And um, just a little last thing to say about these one day events that are very common. The average participation rate is 3%. The Rural Rover is a form of a satellite collection or otherwise known as a mobile collection. Um, it involves the multiple sites, either simultaneously or in sequence happening. There's two or more collection sites. They may be operated on the same day, followed by sites opening in different locations. So this Rural Rover here is you have a truck. It could be a municipal staff preferably it's trained municipal staff, or you could hire a hazmat company to do this that has the trained crews that you employ. And basically you are able to cover in a day, you can go to three different sites. So for example, you could go to Halifax from nine to 10, then you move on to Whitingham, which is next to Halifax from 1030 to 1130, and then to Reedsboro from 12 to 1. So you sort of, you know, plan the distance between your communities, travel time, pack up time, you go to the next community. This is really convenient for people because you can offer more of these throughout the season or even throughout the year if your weather is permits that. Um, and if someone from like Halifax forgot it was 9 to 10, they still have time to hop on over to Whitingham or Reedsboro. So there's more opportunities for them to get rid of their household hazardous waste. Um, if you do it with municipal staff and have an approved hazmat storage facility, and you can, um, you can do it that way because it has to come back to a storage facility though. It has to come back to a hazmat storage facility. If you don't have that, you're gonna have to hire a contractor to do this mobile, mobile unit for you, mobile collection. And, um, I have a list of everything you would need if you want to do it yourself, but I don't have to go over that here. So they provide the ongoing year round collection of HHW. It has the advantage both of the area wide one day scenario and the fixed site scenario. It is estimated that mobile units are more cost effective and cost efficient than a one day collection site. So let me just show you the pictures here. We have, again, municipal staff. They're at a mobile unit. They have all the supplies that we've stacked down the truck if we're using a roll-off container, a 30-yard roll-off, have it all fit and ready, and they're trained, hazmat trained, to be able to do this 40-hour hazmat trained. Um, so you could collect it that way. You could collect it using just a trailer if you don't think you're gonna get that much. We found it was much easier to use the roll-off containers because they were definitely more contained. Having maybe a system where a pickup truck and a trailer set up with the Wranglers, the Cowboys, the pallets, the buckets, the barrels. I mean, you do have to have all of your um, material that is hazmat certified kind of stuff. Um, you can have this set up to maybe if there's overflow or maybe if someone's like behind schedule, you can get this smaller unit going where it needs to go. Okay, we need to move on here. But as I said, it comes back to, oh, that's just another picture of what it could look like in the roll off. And it has to come back to one of these permanent sites. And I'm gonna run into that permanent site right now because we're short of time. Um, so the permanent facility, you can purchase one of these. They're about $25,000 for the environmental approved HHW storage building. Um, the one day 
collections are great for raising public awareness, but this is a long-term solution. It actually has an 8% um, average participation rate is 8% versus that 3% for the one day collection. You're um, they're open for a few days a week usually. They have a high operation cost, but single event collection costs per participant were nearly twice those of a permanent site. Um, you do need, these are the current building requirements. You don't have to purchase one of those hazmat buildings, storage buildings, environmentally approved one. You could create your own, build your own, and this, this is just a list of the building requirements that you will need. The consolidation aspect, that is um, staff consolidating materials. For example, pouring the oil-based paints into a 55-gallon drum versus putting all those paint cans that may only be half full into a cowboy wrangler. Um, you know, it takes up less space because you are paying for that container, the cost of that container. Safety area suggestions, the usual. And then suggested staff training. I think this should be staff training for anybody, regardless um, if you have uh, collecting HHW or not. But you do, you will need that 24 or 40 hour has whopper with your annual refresher. And you can just read the list yourself as it pops up slowly. And just a little heads up, there's a lot of material that we're covering here today, lots, lots, lots. And so I know we promised that it was only gonna be an hour and a half and just bear with us if we go a little bit over, we won't go two hours, I don't think, but we may end up going a little over an hour and a half. Don't run away yet. <laughs> so uh, for I think the remainder of time, we'll be going over some common HHW products, the stuff your uh, operator that you probably see this um, when you hold your HHW days. So uh, based on national data, this might be different wherever you're coming from, uh, what they're seeing is that on a HHW days, they're seeing 50% paints and paint products, 20% used motor oil, 20% solvents, pesticides, and herbicides, and then 10% batteries, unidentified materials, miscellaneous items, all kinds of fun stuff that we run into, that people want to get rid of. So as we were talking about before, um, the segregating by hazard type. So when you have these days, this is how you'll be segregating or your contractor will be segregating these materials into corrosives, according to acid and base, flammables and combustibles, reactives, oxidizers, and poisons. And just a plug for the, if you do the rural rover collection and you have municipal staff that do that, so the containers that I talked about that you're putting on your trailer or into your 30 yard roll off, you have to have containers that can separate these into these categories on your truck. Okay. And again, we're we talking about cost because that's important to every town. Uh, how much are these days going to cost? So we've you know, we not only want to help prevent these hazardous waste from entering our environment, but we also want to be cost effective. Uh, the cost of a collection day program can range between $30 and $300 per participant. Program with high participation may cost $2 per pound of HHW, while a program with low participation may cost over $9 a pound. So depending on what budget you're looking at, um, you either really want to get that high participation going um, and get more, more people involved. And we won't forget about um, intangible costs or intangible benefits, such as increased public awareness that will be raised during the publicity surrounding the collection event. There's also a need for an educational approach, which makes a certain amount of sense. Um, and so when we're talking about costs, um, so the ability to quickly and cheaply dispose of these household wastes is determined by the ability of people 
decommissioning the lab packs to maintain records so that the acceptance of the waste can be approved at a licensed treatment facility. Uh, household hazardous waste handling will change in the near future if municipalities and the environmental industry can provide a service in a cost-effective manner. So these waste should continue to be handled appropriately. Well, yeah, one of the mobile units that I had been reading about that I didn't mention was um, actually curbside pickup of household hazardous waste. Um, and again, that's the, the least cost method for a municipality for the disposal of the household hazardous waste is to provide either that mobile facility, which is loaded and managed by the municipality, um, or, you know, somebody who's, who is hazmat trained and able to bring it to a decommission center has that curbside pickup that I had read about. Door-to-door household hazardous waste program. We don't see too many of those, <laughs> but you can Google that if you want. Now looking at general disposal regulations. Um, so now let's guess the for regulated items that solid waste facilities can accept on a daily basis. So residents don't have to wait for that HHW day. And you can reduce your collection costs. So again, that's getting that information out there so people aren't bringing in these items on an HHW day. Uh, and again, businesses, so for businesses, all hazmat is restricted. You have nickel, cadmium batteries and other rechargeable batteries, mercury added products, lead acid batteries, fluorescent light bulbs, propane cylinders, computers, motor oil, asbestos, paint, freon, and medicines. We'll be looking into each of these briefly. Right, and I can't stress enough that the single most important aspect to limiting the cost of a household hazardous waste collection is decommissioning the lab packed waste prior to disposal. And so the, this list that Sarah just read off can be decommissioned prior to disposal. You don't need the hazmat companies to be there doing it for you. So looking at universal wastes under federal and state uh, guidelines, they are hazardous, they can da cause damage to the environment and our human health if not properly managed. They can save money if recycled properly. You must be compliant with rules and regulations of accepting them. So again, looking to your, your local state regulations. Um, we have streamlined regulations, promote the collection and recycling of universal waste, ease the regulatory burden on retail stores and other generators that wish to collect these wastes and transporters. Encourage the development of municipal and commercial programs to reduce the quantity going into municipal solid waste landfills or um, combustors. So the federal universal waste regulations are found in that Title 40 again, um, and that's in batteries, pesticides, mercury containing equipment, and mercury lamps. And who is a handler of these wastes? So someone who receives a universal waste at their facility, someone who makes it, stores it, or sends a universal waste to another party. And households are not considered handlers. So what you can, can do and can't do, what handlers can do and can't do. So they can't dispose of it, treat it such as crushing lamps on purpose, give it to someone who isn't going to handle it legally. So I'm sure this seems pretty uh, common sense to most people who handle, handle these on a regular basis, but it's good to review this. And then things handlers can do is follow your state rules. Always remember that containers holding waste must be, and looking at these pictures, so Want to make sure that they're closed, so that one's not closed, in good condition, not cracking or leaking, and compatible with the waste, so no mixing of waste. And I'm going to put a shout out for the NHDES because they were kind enough to let us use some um, photographs, photos from some of their past trainings, so thank you. <laughs> so uh, when is a container needed? So if batteries are leaking or damaged, all pesticides, mercury devices, damaged or intentionally broken CRTs, and automotive antifreeze. When is the storage time? What is the storage time requirement? So you must store for one year or less, so no more than a year. 
You have to date container item, maintain a proper inventory, store more than one year only if necessary to allow the proper recovery, treatment, disposal, contract to prove it, date and date on all materials, of course. Uh, what, do, what to do about a leak? So respond to leaks and other releases, immediately contain, clean up in 24 hours, if human health or environment is threatened, notify your local fire company and state environmental department. And what about shipping? So ship in compliance with DOT standards, use a bill of lading, not required to use a registered hazardous waste transporter. Handlers must be trained to recognize risks of waste, be familiar with waste handling and emergency procedures. And we also um, received another note that we missed out on mentioning the automotive antifreeze and the cathode ray tubes are universal waste. So that they are. We didn't add that to our front list. Uh, we will be discussing them. Yeah, we are discussing them. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so batteries, so alkaline and carbon zinc. Right, so um, they are not. So your alkaline and carbon zinc batteries are non-hazardous. Um, the ones on the screen are the batteries that are considered universal waste. Um, in 1996, the federal law um, was adopted. It was the Mercury Containing and Rechargeable Battery Act that prohibited addition of mercury to batteries except for button cells. So what does that mean? That means in 1996, alkaline um, batteries no longer contained mercury, carbon zinc batteries, they probably didn't have mercury to begin with, but the, the federal law was adopted. They were cleaned out. So now your alkaline batteries, the vendors will take them for, from you for a price um, and ask for documentation that they are truly recycled and not disposed of if you're paying somebody to take your alkaline batteries. Again, it's a fuzzy world out there because if you're sending them to an incinerator, then it's really not good to have the alkaline and carbon zinc batteries in, uh, ignited. Um, and they do still have their corrosive qualities to them if they're sitting around for a while. But I'm just explaining why they are not considered banned from the landfill or universal waste. But these are. So check with your transfer station, basically, if you're a resident see if they take these. So rules for universal waste batteries, any battery leaking or at risk of leaking goes into a closed container and compatible with other leaking batteries. Label containers holding them. Of course, you want to label everything universal waste batteries, waste batteries, and used batteries. And keep container lids loose. We don't want to have a buildup of dangerous gases or fumes. Right. Thank you. Vermont has a battery stewardship take back ah. program. Love those take back programs. That's great. Um, so let's just looking at safety here, eye protection. Of course, we're working with batteries. Um, you want to have a proper covering that's covered and raised off the ground. And if you do have a leaking battery, you want to have the bucket and your neutralizer. And then you put, not, right, yeah. you put that on the bottom. You don't yeah. want to take your neutralizer and put it on top of your leaking right. battery. Um, so you just want to, you know, it may spatter when you do that. And so that's why you don't want to do that. But, you know, put so be careful. That's why we say wear your acid proof gloves, wear your eye protection, and then have your bucket, your neutralizer, and then throw the leaking batteries or place, not throw them on that. And then you're going to save all of that um, and you'll send it to your person who collects them, or you may have to save it for the HHW event. All right, looking at mercury added products. So we know that mercury is a pretty dangerous product and it's one of those mi widespread persistent toxic contaminants in our environment. Its incorporation into many products and emissions from combustion processes has resulted in well-documented instances of population poisoning, high level exposure, um, this happens worldwide. So mercury is an environmental concern because it is a heavy metal that can accumulate in living tissue, cause adverse health effects. When mercury-containing devices dispose of in a landfill or incinerator, 
the mercury in it can escape to contaminate air, soil, surface, water, and groundwater. And those are, sorry, I just kind of brushed ahead of those, all those pictures there. What is it? Um, I think we will go into those as well, though. So just a, just a diagram of how it kind of uh, bioaccumulates in the environment, um, you know, from, from the water and different organisms and all the way up to, to, our, to humans and get into our bodies. Um, so it's definitely persistent and does not go away. So mercury is found in mercury switches, gas safety valve controls, capillaries and bulbs, washing machines, gas hot water heaters, um, tilt switches that are in automobiles and appliances, your silent wall switches and electric relays, sometimes in your vacuum gauges, um, vacuum and gauges like the barometers and manometers. And uh, yeah, and then also the fluorescent high intensity discharge lights, mercury lamps. So these are all considered universal waste. Anything, your mercury switches, your mercury lamps, your thermostats and thermometers. Um, for the past last 30 years, the mercury containing waste from business industry and institutions has been considered a hazardous waste because it often falls into that standard EPA toxicity test limit. And uh, more recently, a less restrictive waste handling option has been added to both the state and federal hazardous waste regulations for certain mercury containing waste. And that's why they're now the universal waste. So they fell under the hazardous waste because of the EPA toxicity test limits, but then we've come up with calling them universal waste, which makes it easier to manage them. Um, and they are equally likely to come from either the regulated or unregulated sources. And only thermostats and hazardous waste, the mercury containing lamps are currently listed as universal wastes. And those button cell batteries, but they're under batteries. Um, we got another great comment from um, NHGES and in the water products, but specifically um, the mercury tilt switches uh, that were in cars are there's no they're no longer there they've there's since 1994 so yeah. mercury has been taken out of a lot of devices um and i think it's important to to find out which ones are still prevalent today that end up getting right. dropped off and it's you know yeah it's sort of like the same idea with the alkaline batteries in 1996 people still had them kicking around their house you know so we collected them for like a good 10 years we still kept them out of the regular trash because we figured after 10 years the the new ones being built in 2000 plus would be following those guidelines so you you might have a car that's older than 1994 you may have a refrigerator freezer right or the the ovens um that the gas ovens you know they may be older you never know what you're going to get especially when it comes to those chest freezers it seems that people hold on to those for a long time because mm -hmm. those two the mercury switches were moved out of them i think in early 2000 it is good to know that they are being phased out of many devices. Um, rules for mercury out of products, any leaking devices into a closed compatible container. Of course, labeling is, again, universal waste, waste mercury containing, used mercury containing device. And looking at boxes, the following mercury added products are banned from the landfill disposal and are required to be labeled in, in many states thermostats, thermometers, switches, individually or part of other products, medical or scientific, electric relays or other electric devices, lamps, batteries, other than button cells. And so this is just a picture of the different ways that the tubes are collected. And a lot of people mention about the labels. You can make your own label. You don't have to purchase them. Just make sure they stick on the box. Sometimes it's hard. Those boxes get dusty. So looking at another uh, product here. Universal waste. Universal waste. We have pesticides. They're the toughest universal waste rules. They're designed to intentionally kill, of course, um, in, in a form that they can easily get moved, inhaled, ingested, soaked into your skin, or dissolved. So which pesticides are we talking about here? Um, those that are suspended or recalled under the federal insecticide, fungicide, rodenticide act 
um, FIFRA, <laughs> FIFRA. an easier way to say it. Um, and FIFRA defines the term unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. Any unreasonable risk to man or the environment, taking into account the economic, social, environmental costs, human and dietary risks and residues that result from a use of a pesticide in or any food inconsistent with the standard under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Right. So all pesticides that are distributed or sold in the United States, they must be registered and licensed by EPA. And then before EPA um, may register a pesticide under FIFRA, the applicant must show, among other things, that using the pesticide according to specifications will not generally cause unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. And so this is another one of those lists that do change. And if you want to find out which ones are FIFRA, um, they, you can go to the epa.gov pesticides site or just contact the Department of Agriculture for a, the most up-to-date list of these pesticides that are falling under FIFRA. So they must be in a container, um, something better than a Quaker Oats container or a, a you know, a bottle other than what it came in, something safer, label with original package, or uh, an official, really easy to read, universal waste label. And of course, you want adequate aisle space, um, you know, between materials. So we're looking at two feet. You need to have your emergency response telephone postings. Your outdoor storage requirements, definitely a barrier, fence wall surrounding the waste, a controlled gate entry, and then posting a sign that says danger, unauthorized personnel, keep out. And we, again, looking at safety, stored on an impervious surface, so you can't get through to the ground. Secondary containment if near floor, drain sinks, or manholes, fire equipment nearby, spill control, decontamination equipment. Your personnel has to be, you have to do training for your personnel if you're handling these uh, pesticides, universal waste pesticides. So a formal written training plan that tells who, what, and when trained in hazardous waste management. And it has to six months because you have to receive your training every six months. You need strict documentations of the training records, and you cannot handle these pesticides until you're trained. So looking at some common regulated wastes here, we have asbestos and antifreeze that we'll be looking at. So asbestos, um, do not put in regular trash, trash of course, um, is friable or dust removed by professional company, so it's in that form and non-friable, so tile and roofing. For the homeowner, um, removal is okay. Um, I know in a lot of older schools that we've been in, they have companies that do this type of removal um, to be able to dispose of it properly and safely. So improper disposal of antifreeze. Um, if your facility takes antifreeze, um, then this is great for your residents. So thank you for doing that. Um, improper disposal of antifreeze in the city sewer or system can end up at the wastewater treatment plant, such as this picture, which was a real life event, <laughs> unfortunately, where the wastewater treatment facility saw the tank treatment area turn green and then bubbly oil came up. Or in the local stream, so antifreeze is corrosive and contains heavy metals and other things that can make it toxic to fish and wildlife. And just to reiterate uh, from NHDS, the note that they sent us was antifreeze is a universal waste. And briefly how to collect it. Um, so keep the environment safe. So you want to properly collect it. On the left side, the residents drop off the antifreeze in a designated area. So temporary, this is a temporary drop off area for the work day when the facility is open. So you want to see who's monitoring it. Are the residents dropping off antifreeze? Do you have a system in place where the resident shows you the container? Does the resident have to put it in clear containers so you can see the contents? Do you want to put their name and number on the container? This will help you in the long run to be able to identify contents. 
And then the photo on the right, again, is where you'd be storing it, collecting it. Um, it may not be where the residents are going to be dropping it off. So you just want to make sure that your storage containers, uh, you have the right equipment nearby to clean up. You want to make sure the drum is in good condition. Um, and, you know, is it compatible with the content? So antifreeze is corrosive and it should be in a plastic drum because the metal can rust or rot. And again, labeling, very important to label. I think I'm going to just you know, quickly talk about storage, what's right and what's wrong. Um, here, you probably note that you don't want to store it in a metal container. You want it to be in a plastic container that's not going to corrode and make sure it's in good condition, not where it's going to leak into the ground. Shipping no limit on amount, follow state DOT requirements, have a bill of ladling, all those standard um, rules for shipping a, a waste like this. So I'm looking at computers and electronic waste, uh, electronics. Um, so you have lead and barium in the glass, bromated flame retardants in the plastic, mercury LCD screens, lead cadmium beryllium in computer towers, valuable metals. So all kinds of things inside these these electronics. Right, and pointing out again, cathode ray tubes are the universal waste. Electronic waste ban. So this is an example with New Hampshire. Prohibits disposal of any video device, central processing unit, or of a computer or non-mobile video display. Eliminates a major source of toxic chemicals that we talked about, lead, cadmium, mercury, and the waste stream, and encourages recycling of electronic waste. So why the ban? Uh, disposal capacity and hazardous constituents such as lead. And those CRTs, cathode ray tubes, contain four to eight pounds of each of lead. So what is banned? So video display devices, the liquid crystal display, gas plasma, uh, greater than four inches diagonal, and video display media record player. And again, just pointing out, this is, we're just showing you an example of a state, New Hampshire, as we ground. So check with your state, it may be a little different. What is not banned as e-waste, so devices with embedded computers, um, automobiles, robots, machines, toys, if primary functions to control the device, keyboards and other non-video display items. Of course, you know, there's a ton of electronics out there. And we could do an entire module, which we have done on electronics. So again, if, if you're managing this, at a minimum, you need to post your signs at the facility, provide written notification, or have an agreement with your customers if there's a concern, you know, the disposal ban. Um, your options for e-waste, you could bring, have collected at the household hazardous waste collections. It could be long-term collections at your transfer stations, Goodwill. There's take-back programs at the retailers. There could be donations. Take the take-back back programs, these are them right here. All your standard um, you know, electronic stores. And with, with any item, any product, it's ebbs and flows, you know, we're sort of at a hard, a difficult time with managing electronics. There's not as many take back programs as there used to be. Um, electronics recycling in the region. So this is an interesting map because it tells you who has the take back laws, take back laws for consumer electronics. And that actually is an incentive. Um, all the New England states have the disposal ban. What is included and how they work varies by state. So that's why we want you to definitely check with your state. We're just giving you some brief examples of this, things that go boom and managing the waste. Um, New Hampshire and Massachusetts do not have take back laws for consumer electronics. And it's important to go through a certified electronics recycler um, the only way it's the only way to ensure it's not self-certifying or making unsubstantiated claims. So you want to make sure that your electronics aren't going somewhere they shouldn't be. Again, what is certified? So recycler that has an assessment done by an independent third-party organization. And that's either R2 or E Stewards does that. So again, household has its waste, long-term collection, take back, and donation. 
So looking at ways to, just like every other uh, ways for looking at how to collect it and store it safely. Um, is it piled up in the corner or is it um, off the ground? Is it covered? You want to really be careful about breakage. Um, outdoors, indoors, labeling is always very important. Nice and neat over to the right there. Even though it's indoors, it's in a container, so it has a cover to it. Um, outdoors, that's not a good picture over there on the <laughs> left. It's just a mess. Here, even though it is contained and they may have a list of what it is, um, it's a little bit sloppy. It's not so stable because, again, this is a shipping container. Or they may be pulling it out because that's sometimes what happens is you have a container on site where you put it into. But then when it comes time for the actual um, person who's transporting it to the facility comes to pick it up, you don't really actually want to handle these things more than once. So we're hoping that that's a container that's just going to go on a truck and go away. Uh, but you do have to be careful about the way that you pack it so it's stable. And then always, like everything else, where are they going? Make sure you get your manifest. Make sure you know that your um, recyclables, your electronics, that they're being brought to a properly a facility that's properly recycling them. Get your shipping papers. And then um, moving on to free on recovery. So do you accept appliances that contain the CFCs or free on the core, CFC core containing? Cartons. Do you extract the refrigerants yourself or have a certified company? And I know that NRA has done some, I think, trainings on how to properly take those out of um, the yeah. refrigerant, refrigerants. They just sent out a, a constant contact that they're really, uh, they've been focusing a lot on this free on recovery. So they're, they're really uh, ramping up on the training and connecting uh, folks with more uh, people that come and do it, but you know what? If you can have someone on your facility that's trained to do it, it's not rocket science, and it sure helps you with some costs, helps you keep things under control. You can organize them, like when units are coming in, you know, you want to put an X on completed units, and you would know that because, you know, you get it's something that you can just do on a daily basis or maybe a weekly basis. You get your um, Freon containing devices, you start packing them over to one side, and then you have your staff person who gets to go over there and take out the Freon when they got a chance to, mark it with his X, and then move on to something else. It There is a fine. You cannot release Freon uh, you, into the uh, air. You cannot dispose of it, right? It's a $37,500 dollar per violation so again this could be a whole training in itself um just some quick information on how to properly care for this material um, you can look up more information on the epa or contact your local environmental protection department so looking at um, waste uh, medicine that you might be collecting in needles and sharps so never open containers encourage take back programs. Uh, I know police departments do do, do that. Um, they can go in the trash. Um, best management practice, you take a, a plastic bottle basically, duct tape cap shut, warning label, use syringes, do not recycle. Right, and that has to do with the needles and sharps, the medicine. Um, you know, we do have now more take back programs for medicines. Uh, there's something that you want to be collecting at the yeah, at the HHW collection. And uh, again, thank you, Tara. We, um, I want to stress, if you have that staff person, we're moving the Freon, they must be certified. So they have to be certified. We just don't want someone going over there doing it blindly. Um, yeah, and so we're going to show another brief video, another PSA that we did, uh, I did for Wyndham Solid Waste District back in the day. You'd be surprised by many of the people who use needles in their home. Some use needles to control their diabetes. Some use them to deal with other medical conditions. These home uses will lead to a projected 1 billion syringes, needles, and lancets entering the waste stream this year. And each one of those needles is a potential health hazard. They can carry germs that might infect waste haulers and recycling staff with a variety of diseases, including hepatitis B. 
Here are some very important don'ts regarding the disposal of needles. Don't throw syringes and needles directly into the trash. Don't put used syringes and needles in with your recyclables. Don't use coffee tins or glass jars to dispose of needles in your household trash. Instead, bring your used needles to the Wyndham Salad Waste Facility at Old Ferry Road. Ask your physician if she or he will take used needles for safe disposal. Ask your pharmacy if they participate in a needle return program. If those options aren't open to you, put your needles in a clear plastic soda bottle. Tape the cap on and apply a label that says, use needles, do not recycle. Then dispose of them in your household trash. Let's keep everybody in our community safe. Dispose of your needles properly. Wyndham Solid Waste Management District, 327 Old Ferry Road in Brattleboro, 802-257-0. Okay, so what should you do? So this is medicine? right. This is your unwanted medicine. We took a little needle break there. Um, do not flush and don't keep any unwanted medicines in the home because remember our diagram way back about the flushing and the septic and the groundwater. Yes, you wouldn't want to be flushing your needles either. You don't want to flush <laughs> those needles either. That's true. <laughs> so first choice, um, you know, to get everybody involved is the take back event working with your local um, police or safety departments uh, this is a great way to get a lot at one time and you can make sure that everything's being disposed of properly and second choice um, kind of home disposal is take medicines out of original container conceal or remove personal information that's important mix with undesirable substance add some water to solid medicines Put mixture into container with a lid or sealable bag and then place into the trash uh, to make sure it's not getting into the, anyway, the place we don't want it to be in someone else's hands or in the environment. Right, right. and the thing too, people actually started saying you can put them in uh, your old latex paint that now you're drying up. So you just dump your medicine in there, dry them up with the paint, and then put it in your trash. Speaking of, Speaking of paint. paint. Um, so we just have a couple more things to talk about here. Um, we kind of went through the whole gamut of um, materials, but quickly paint, um, product stewardship programs, um, such as paint care, oil-based constituent, constitute the largest volume of household hazardous waste, and latex uh, should not be accepted at the HHW day. It can be dried out and disposed of in the trash. Propane tanks are difficult for residents and transfer stations. Propane is heavier than air, so it will sink and gather in low spots. So explosive, of course, prohibited from trash disposal. And we don't want to be punctured. Um, so well, actually, <laughs> oh, puncture, sorry. you do want to you want to either try to remove those valves before you go putting it in the scrap metal bin. And actually, now a lot of scrap metal dealers want to see that you punctured it, which is always a questionable uh, task to do at your transfer station because uh, you never know if it's quite empty. Um, so, but that is what they're requiring is that you puncture it to then place in the scrap metal bin. So we'd only recommend that for um, transfer stations. Oh, do not remove the valves. Well, that's a new one. Okay, keep the valves intact. I would love to ask why. So just yeah, that. they need to be certified. You need to be certified again to remove valves. Good, thank you. Glad we got everybody together here today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, you know, webinars are tough because if we were doing this in a room, everybody could share their knowledge. Um, we're just setting out the guidelines. Smoke detectors. Um, there's recycling options for those. So, NRA's vendor, Veolia. Environmental Services is now accepting smoke detectors. So if you have questions or you're wondering about where to bring these, um, give us a call. Um, get pricing for you and compare pricing with an HHW day option. Yeah, and not everybody wants is going to take them at your HHW day. There's that little bit of radioactive material that everyone says is not dangerous. Go ahead, throw it in your trash. But there's that idea that if everybody's throwing a bunch of these in the trash, it adds up, it accumulates. So uh, got used motor oil. I think it's last but not least here. 
um, mark containers, used oil for recycle. Um, you don't want to just put waste oil on there. Again, these containers should be in good condition and stored in the proper place. And again, checking with your um, state regulations on how to properly store motor oil or any kind of any kind of oil. Um, yeah, it's best if it's on a non-impervious non-pervious or impervious surface. Yep. Yeah. You don't want it leaking into the ground. And then these are just uh, slides from, uh, again, from NHDES because they were so kind to let us use some of their training material from their, uh, I don't even know if they're still doing these trainings. But just, you know, why, here we go. This is why we want to be very careful about our hazardous waste management. And some of the resources that we've used today, so EPA website, pesticides and hazardous waste information. Um, there's this really great guide. It's a guide for small businesses made from the EPA. Um, great shout out to New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services for the information provided in this webinar and provided today to us to make sure we're giving the right information. So that's always good. Vermont Agency of Natural Resources also. Um, videos are from the Wyndham Solid Waste Management District, and we use a lot of the federal information from the U.S. Code of Federal Regula Regulations. And we did get another comment that, is, I think this is about the valves. Um, do not remove the valves, which we said. You need to be certified to remove them. It is against safety, safety laws. There is a Mercury, 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 mercury capture. capture in them. It is hazardous, also a huge safety issue. Interesting, from the propane tanks. So I Great. think, yeah, in general, common sense probably not to not to puncture these if you're not. Well, this is certified. this has to do with removing the valves. Yeah, it doesn't have to do with. Um, I'm asking the question now out there, so <laughs> it doesn't have to do with puncturing them, does it? Please respond. You can discuss propane tanks later. Okay. We'll be discussing propane tanks later. Yeah, it's a tough one. They are a tough one. Um, we just wish they were empty and all the way, and then we could put them in the metal container. All right, so this concludes our training module of things that go boom and other regulated wastes. And thank you to the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services for permitting us to duplicate their training material, some of their training material. Um, you might get a survey at the end of this or an email. So again, if you want to get some credit for today, we'll send you a certificate with the hours that you did here today. Um, so take the survey. If you don't get it, just email us. We'll make sure you get your certificate and survey. Um, and we'll get the certificates out after we review all the answers. Um, if you have questions right now, please feel free to shout out to us right now or send us an email, give us a call. Yeah, and it's like we said in the beginning, there's a lot that we covered on things that go boom, and each one of these sections could be its own module. So we apologize for not having a lot of time to go every into everything more deeply. Um, and, you know, we'll, we're continuing to create these training modules. Like I said, we had one for just electronics alone. Um, and the purpose as part of our grant is to um, bring together people from schools and connect them with their transfer stations. So we're creating these modules to kind of get a broader audience. Um, so we want you know both transfer station operators, we want those solid waste districts, we want some people from the public, and we're educating on you know kind of the behind the scenes of what's happening with hazardous waste. Really to get the conversation going yeah. between the town and the gown and uh, where can people go to get more information? Who who are those other uh, professionals? Okay, a couple more minutes. So yep, get we have in. just a follow up. Um, so this is from Tara from the New Hampshire DES. We can discuss propane tanks later do not puncture or devalve them unless you are certified. So again, that's that certified. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, we all have makes sense. Again, if you have any further questions, you can see our number at the bottom of the screen here. Look us up online. Um, we're around to answer any questions you have or give us information. We're always. <laughs> and it's really nice um, when you fill out those evaluations. Yes, we have questions regarding uh, some of the things we mentioned in the PowerPoint, just so you are eligible to get your professional development credits. Uh, but we also really would like to hear how you thought, what you thought about the presentation, um, whether it's going to help, like I said in the beginning, whether it's going to help you in your job, um, share the knowledge that you have with us and what you may decide to change or do differently in your job as a result of this training. All right. Well, thank you so much for hanging out. We still got people hanging in there with us. So thank you again. Applause. <laughs> applause. Applause. Thank you, everyone.